those of you who don't know, this is Pastor Andrew, and he's an amazing man of God, and he has a word this morning that is going to rock your world. And, uh, and we're in a season of testimonies, and this is, this is an amazing testimony. So give it up for Pastor Andrew as he delivers the word. Thank you. Yeah, as Pastor Mike said, we are in a, a season of testimonies, and we are excited to celebrate what God has been doing by sharing the testimonies. We really believe that this is laying a foundation for the next season that God has prepared for our church. And so two weeks ago, uh, David Bloom was up here with, with Pastor Mike, and he shared his testimony. Last week, uh, we heard from Pastor Ray and her powerful testimony. And this week, I'm excited to get to share what God's been doing in, in my life over the last year, year and a half. Um, but as I do, I, I don't want you all to just be encouraged by a, a testimony. I, I want us to make a conscious decision this morning that we would allow the power of the Word and the power of the Spirit and the power of the testimony uh, to change us, to make us more like Jesus. So as I say a quick prayer, would, would you agree with me in prayer to say, God, today I want to consciously partner with what you're doing and allow your Spirit and your Word to change my heart to make me more like Jesus. Father, this is our, our hearts, and so we don't want to just come on a Sunday morning to check church off of our list. We don't want to just sit through a message and say, well, that was nice. Lord, we want to be changed from the inside out. We want to become more like you. And so, Father, I pray that you would use my words um, to, to accomplish that. Father, that you would speak through me, that you would uh, be the gatekeeper of my mouth, that I wouldn't misrepresent uh, your word or my story at all, but, Father, that I would speak truth and love, and that today we would be better because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Um, as you can tell from looking at me, I, I go to the gym. And, but what you can't tell from looking at me is I talked a friend of mine into getting a, a gym membership as well. And so the two of us had worked out a couple times together, but then lives got busy and we stopped working out together. Uh, different work schedules and it just practically it didn't make sense. But both of us were in a similar season where we were having our first child and we thought, okay, well, health is important. We want to live to see our grandchildren. And more importantly, we want to be healthy when they're born, you know, thinking in terms of legacy, like I want to be the young grandparent that gets to run with the toddlers. Uh, Luna and myself both are blessed. Our, both of our parents, both sets of our parents are in great physical health. And so when Ryan Kate, who's two and a half now, gets to visit with them, they're able to get down on the ground with her and play and have fun. And, and so my friend and I thought, well, we want to be like that. And those good habits start today. You don't wait until you're 60 and then think, I'm going to run a four minute mile. That's not usually how that works. And so, so we got these gym memberships and we started going. But as you guys have seen year and year again, those January, like January uh, New Year's resolutions never last long and same even when you start mid-year it's hard to keep going to the gym and so my friend had had stopped going and then strangely enough like our gym location had closed and they transferred us to another one and and he still wasn't going and I was telling him like this this new gym's even better like they've got massage chairs which is fantastic you can go you can sit in the sauna and then you can sit in the in the steam room and then you can sit in the massage chair and you can have a workout and you can leave feeling great about yourself he was paying every month because he'd subscribe to this membership, being a part of a gym, and philosophically, he loved the idea of a gym. He loved being healthy. He loved, you know, I'm going to live forever. Like, he loved this kind of, I'm going to be in good health. I'm going to look great, feel great, be great. Um, but he had stopped going, and he was missing out on, on some of the perks of, of gym life. Now, not necessarily the, the hard work of it, but he was missing out on some of the, the good parts of it, the massage chairs and the steam rooms and the lap pool and like those fun niceties that, that our gym had. And uh, what God was showing me is I was going through a similar season. Um, this was several months back. My, the testimony I'm sharing with you all has taken place over the last like 18 months. And, and I was in a season where I was subscribed to the ideas in the Bible. Uh, I had this subscription. I was, I was still philosophically, I loved all of it, but I had stopped really going to the Bible every day, and I'd stopped getting some of the benefits of when you spend time with the Bible. I was starting to get out of shape in my faith, and, and there was this beautiful moment because of God's grace and his goodness and his mercy. He was calling me back. He was saying, hey, hey, 
I know that it's been a little while, and I was still seeing God, you know, I mean, I'm a pastor on staff at a church, so I'd still, like, interact with God as, like, an employer, almost, of, like, you know, I'd show up and be like, okay, God, what do we have to prepare for the youth, and what do we have to do for this, and, uh, but in my personal time, and, like, just in my heart, in my mornings, him and I, we had grown kind of distant, and he brought me to the Psalms, and Psalms chapter 27, verse 8, it says this, it says, my heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. And, that, and that's kind of the best way to describe what the season was. In God's gracious goodness, he had reached out and he said, Andrew, I, I want to spend more time with you. We haven't seen each other in a friend or in an in a intimate way. We've only just been passing at work, like coworkers. And he says, I, I want to spend time with you. And my heart said, oh, Lord, I hear you calling. I'm coming. And so this started a, a rich season where I would wake up early and I'd make that my first priority. I'd go down into the basement, I'd turn on some worship music, and I'd spend time in prayer and in worship and reading the word, and everything just came alive. Hopefully you've had a season like that before in your life where the word of God just comes alive. As you read it, you're pouring over it. Maybe it was when you were first saved, or maybe it was years after that, but there are those times where there's a special grace on as you're reading the word. It's not just a discipline. It's not just something that I do because I know I'm supposed to, but you love it and you fall in love with it. And I'd, and I'd come back to this season after a, a time of kind of being dry and a time of not really wanting to, the word of God was coming alive to me. And as it was coming alive, uh, God was beginning to show me some areas of my life where, where I wasn't living in alignment with, with his kingdom or with his word. Ryan Kate, my daughter, is two and a half now and we're starting to instill some of these family values into her. Um, but she's only two, and so we're starting with the basics, like uh, peaceful conflict resolution. You can't hit your friends. Like, that's a, that's a big one. It's hard for two-year-olds. When they get upset, they don't know how to communicate very well with words, and so sometimes fists will fly. And so we had to quickly step in and be like, whoa, 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 that's not okay. That's not how we resolve things in our family. And the other one that we're working on is sharing. Everything is mine. Last night, I had a cookie, and I was really looking forward to enjoying my cookie, and Ryan Kate walks up and she's like, oh, I want some cookie. So I broke off half my cookie and I gave it to her. And she said, no, that's my cookie. And I was very quick to tell her, no, this is my cookie and you're lucky you're getting half of it. <laughs> and so we're teaching sharing, like not everything is yours. But as she gets older, we'll teach different family values. As she matures, we'll talk about honor and respect and legacy and we'll teach those. But for now, it's mostly just sharing and not everything is mine. And in the same way, as we continue to grow with God, and as I was spending these mornings with him, he was teaching me about some of our kingdom family values. And the one that he was highlighting in me in this season was generosity. He was speaking to my heart about generosity when he was showing me through the word how the kingdom of God and the people in it are called to live generously. And I was a little taken back because I thought, oh, well, God, like, I... I tithe, and once or twice a year, I clean out my closet, and I give all my unused and unwanted junk to Goodwill, so I'm pretty generous. But the Lord was showing me that all throughout the New Testament, what we see is, is not just the early church garage sailing their junk and, and giving it to those in need. They were giving away their, their best and their first. They were selling property and homes. Like, this wasn't just cleaning out the closet and it's like, well, I haven't used these skis in three years. Like, I guess I could give them to someone in need. It was like, oh, no, like, this neighbor or this region or this church in another city that I haven't even been to, they're hurting, and I'm going to give some of my best so that they don't have to hurt. And I was moved, and I thought, oh, God, like, I thought I was generous, but I'm not living at that level of generosity. So God began taking me through this process of, of as I would spend time with him in that morning, as there was this grace of like, oh God, I need you each morning and I need your word. He was illuminating things and they were coming alive. One of the things that I felt him speaking to my heart was he was asking me, where could you give to further what I'm doing on the earth? Where could you give? And he was asking me where, but I was responding, God, I can't give. Like, I live on a ministry salary. Like, I don't have a bunch of extra. I'm, I'm just doing well to, like, provide for my family. I, I don't have enough to give additionally. And so he'd taken me to this passage in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, starting in verse 5, 
Uh, if your Bible has the, the little like subtitles like mine does, it says, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And in verse 5, it begins, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. He turns to Philip, huge crowd of people. He says, where can we get food for all these people? And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And instantly I felt like this connection to this story where Philip is, is at. Jesus was asking where. God was asking me, hey, where could you live more generously? Or where could you give? Or where could you help further what I want to do on the earth? And I was saying, God, well, I don't have enough. Like, even if I worked an extra job or an extra, it wouldn't really make a difference. I don't have enough. But the story continues in verse 8. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? And I felt similar. I was like, yeah, God, even if I had more, what good is that? There's so much you want to do, but like, what good is the little I have? Maybe if I give an extra, you know, the next time the plate goes by, or, or an extra to that missionary friend that I have. Maybe if I gave an extra, but what good is that? And I felt this way, but the story continues. Verse 10, what I imagine is with a twinkle in his eye, Jesus says, tell everyone to sit down. He says, or it continues, so they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. There's even more in attendance because they were just counting the men. So women and children, you can guess 10, 15, maybe 20,000 people there. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. In this story, Jesus was speaking to my heart through it, and, and the Holy Spirit was moving, and it, he was asking me where, and I was telling him I don't have enough. But through this, he shows me there's a young man here at this same situation the disciples are even looking at him saying, what good is this? But he says, I've got these five loaves and these two bread, two, five loaves, two fish. He says, and I'll give it if it helps. And the Lord was asking in turn of me to begin to take what little I had and say, and say Jesus, I have this and you can use it if it helps. Even if it means I don't have it anymore, you can use it if it helps. God was asking me to live generously. But I... I felt like in the natural, I barely had enough, and so I was conflicted. Like, my heart was saying, let's be more generous, but my mind was saying, heart, you don't understand how budgets work. <laughs> and it was a difficult season. Six months before this, in uh, October of 2016, so this is kind of our, our timeline, October of 2016, I had this, uh, beautiful wouldn't be the right word to describe it, I had this special 1995 uh, Toyota 4Runner, and I loved it. I'd affectionately named it Barbara, after Barbara Streisand, and uh, I drove it, and it was unique. It had some quirks, but it got me everywhere. But I was, I was noticing that it was coming to the end of its life, and I thought, I better sell this while I can and get something new. And so I had uh, cleaned it up, I had taken some photos, I would posted it on Craigslist, and I had a guy um, email me, say, hey, I'm interested in your car, can I come look at it this afternoon? And I said, yes. And so I took it to the car wash. I wanted it to look really nice for this guy who was coming to look at it. Um, and so I'm washing it. And during this process, I think Barbara, my forerunner, had caught wind of what was happening. <laughs> she knew that I was going to dump her and, and upgrade to a younger, faster model. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, you don't. You're not dumping me. I'm dumping you. Because I had washed it in the car wash. And then as I started, it turned on great, I'm driving. It didn't make it out of the parking lot of the car wash, and it died. And I try as I may for the next week, there at like the, the parking lot of a Domino's, I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it, and I could not get it to come back. I had lost compression in like four of the cylinders, and it was just a mess, and so it wasn't worth repairing this old, and so I just junked it for a couple hundred bucks. And it broke my heart, because I was like, oh man, like this... I was going to use the money from that to kind of like help me jump up to a, a better car. So for the next six months, we took just those couple hundred dollars instead of like more, and we tried to save up to get an another car. 
So during this time, because we only live like a mile and a half from the church, I'd walk to church or I'd bike to church, and people were kind of seeing me, and they'd like kindly wave and not hit me while I was on my bicycle, which I really appreciated. And they'd wave and they'd see me coming in. And so this six months, Luna and I are trying to save and trying to get a, a second car because it's hard with a toddler to just be a one-car family, but we're making it, and we're close to work, and we're walking. The weather's not that bad. It's Colorado. It's beautiful. So I'm making it. But every time it feels like we get a little bit saved up, something would happen. An unexpected bill, you know, an unexpected expense, and then it's like, ah, oh, and it kind of knocks that savings back down. I'm sure you guys have been there before. And it's unfortunate. But this is where we're at. It's this struggle. We're trying to save, and then, ah, oh, we can't. We try to save, and we can't. So it's during this season that the Lord's impressing on me, hey, I want you to live more generously. And I'm thinking, God, this is a terrible time. Like, why didn't you ask me to live more generously three years ago when we were in a smaller space, two incomes, no kids, like, had less expenses? That would have been a great time to live more generously. But now it's like, I got to pay for, for diapers. I have to, like, save up for another car. Like, this is the worst time. And he didn't seem bothered by that, which should have been reassuring, but it just felt like, God, you're distant. And, and that's, the, that's the, the honesty of it, is it felt like, God, I don't feel like you're really seeing where I'm at. So in April of 2017, Luna and I started praying. This is what we feel like the Lord is speaking to us. This is what we feel like God is calling us to do. And so we gird up all our faith and we say, okay, God, if this is you, we're going to give some extra. We'll, we'll pay our tithe, we'll pay our bills, and with what's left at the end of the month, we'll give extra. And the end of the month came and there wasn't any extra, and so we didn't give. And we thought, ah, that probably wasn't really what God had in mind. And so... In May, we think, let's, let's do this a little bit different. Faith doesn't say, if there's extra, I'll give it. Faith says, I'll give it, and the Lord will make some extra. And so in May, we, we prioritized our giving. Uh, it wasn't any super spiritual thing that we did. We just wrote the check at a different time of the month. And so we, we gave the tithe, and then we gave our extra, and then we paid our bills. And what was beautiful was we, we gave our 10%, and then we doubled that. We gave an extra 10%. And this, was, this took a lot of faith because our budget was only built for that 10%. We gave the 20%, and then we paid our bills. And praise God, we were able to pay all of our bills that month. So May of 2017, we did that. The end of the month is fantastic. We're spilling into the beginning of June, and we're saying, praise God, he provided. This is so awesome. And if the story had stopped there, it would have been good. It would have been a testimony. But it didn't. In God's faithfulness, he wanted to confirm in our hearts and in our lives that this is what he was calling us to. And so through some of the incredible uh, godly men here at The Rock who meet on Thursday mornings, they had gotten together and several of them had seen me walking and biking to church and they said, you know what, Andrew's probably saving for a car, let's help him out. So they took up a little collection, just this, these 15 guys. And in a moment, uh, Pastor Jim had met me, I was working on some video stuff and he said, hey, the guys got together and they wanted to give you this. And it was an envelope. And I was like, okay, thanks. And he's like, no, 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 open it. So I opened it and it was a card. And I was like, that's not my birthday. Why am I a greeting card? I'm like what? And I opened it up and in there was a check. And in a moment, God had over doubled what had taken me six months to save up <laughs> through the generosity of these men. It was beautiful. It was a testimony. God was meeting my needs as I was prioritizing generosity, as, pri as I was prioritizing the kingdom family values, the Lord was taking care of my needs and my wants. Because I was making it walking to church, but it was a want to have a second car. He was taking care of my needs and even my wants, and he was providing miraculously. So, so June finishes out. In July, we bought a car, and it's praise God, like we've got a second car now, and like we're still doing great things. Uh, and, but Luna and I are, are praying again. Okay, do we... Do we continue giving at that 20%? Our budget's not built for it, so we really have to hear from God. And despite the confirmation and despite that, we, we were still wanting to be kind of extra sure. I mean, if you've been there before where God asks you to do something and you're like, okay, I hear you asking me, but are you sure you're asking me? <laughs> and that's kind of where I was at. And so we're, we're there, uh, we start praying and, and we feel like, okay, this is, this is where God's asking us to, to go. And, and so we... We start for the next several months. We say, okay, this is going to be what, what we plan to do. And during this time, uh, the Lord was really highlighting Matthew 6. Jesus is speaking, and in verse 21, he, he addresses a group, and he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He was showing me that there's this beautiful tie between our hearts and our wallets. 
and that God never really wants my money. He doesn't need it. He's got plenty. But what he wants is my heart, and he wants my faith and my trust. And so what he was, was showing me through my own budget and expenses and wallet and checkbook was that there were areas of my life that I didn't trust him. Salvation, spending eternity with him, totally trust him. Um, praying for healing, mostly trust him. My finances, didn't trust him. And so he was showing me like, hey, there's an area of your life that I want to help you and I want to bless you and I want to take care of you, but you're not letting me in. You're, you're saying, no, 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 I'm going to control this and I'm going to make it work and, and I'll crunch the numbers and if it doesn't, you know, I'll make cuts and I'll do this. And then he's saying, I'd like to help you with that if you'd let me. Yeah. And, I, and for the longest time, I wasn't letting him and I didn't even realize I wasn't letting him. But through this beautiful season of, of spending time with him each morning in the Word, he was saying, hey, let me help you. And so this, this act of saying, okay, God, I will prioritize my giving to you was the, the act and the representation of saying, okay, God, I will let you help me with my finances because I can't do it on my own. And so for those next couple months, it was kind of hit and miss. Some months we did better. Some months we hit our goal. A couple months we fell short and we didn't. And then uh, towards the end of November and beginning of December, we said, you know what? We're not going to play around with this anymore. God has demonstrated his faithfulness again and again. Let's really do it. Let's like really prioritize. Not just if there's some left over or, oh, well, we know this expense is coming up, so we can't afford to be generous this month. Like, let's not play that game. Let's go full in. Like, all the chips, God, we'll give you our, our, our 20% every month because we know that you're faithful. And so in December, we started to do that. And at the same time that my heart motivated me to that with faith and with, like, fervor, my mind was like, really? We're picking December to do this? <laughs> because in addition with all the Christmas gifts, uh, our family has a, a bunch of December birthdays. Luna is a December, Ryan Kate is a December, my father-in-law is a December, my sister-in-law is a December, and my mother-in-law is in early January, which means sometimes we buy the gift in December. So in addition to all the Christmas gifts, we had like five other birthday gifts that we also had to buy in December. And I thought, oh, okay, Lord, I don't know if we can really do this. But we set out and I said, let's, let's try. Like, I believe that this is what God has called me to, so let's, so let's do it. And praise God, we were able not only to give the 20%, but we gave 35%, not counting what we gave in gifts that year. So like Christmas and birthday, not counting that. Even though like you could make an argument that that is a, a level of generosity, we said we don't want to just count like, oh, I gave to them, and then they gave back to me, and look, now we're all generous. Like, I didn't want to count that. Like, this was just outside of my family, this was outside giving, we gave a third of our income that month and God still made a way for us to pay all of our bills and for, and for us to pay all of our Christmas and all of your birthday. And praise God. Praise God. This was nothing that I was doing. Like this was all God making a way. I shared this a little bit later with some other people and they were like, wow, that's really cool. You found areas in your budget to cut. And I was like, no, 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 like that's not it at all. Like, I had already cut so many of my, like, flexible spending that it was just fixed income, fixed expenses now where it's like, okay, the mortgage, not really negotiable. Like, lights, not really negotiable. Like, some things I just, I have to pay and I can't negotiate this anymore. God was bringing in money from crazy sources. In December, I had a client who had a, an invoice that was past due by over a year. Because in addition to working with the church, sometimes I do outside projects with websites or graphics or something. And I had, I had done some work for him, and a year had gone by, and I still hadn't gotten paid. And I just sort of, like, you know what, I wrote it off as a loss. I'm not going to ever get this money. He called me up out of a blue in December, in this month where I was like, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but here, here we go. Chips are all in. He called me up out of the blue, and he was like, hey, I think I owe you some money. And I was like, I think so too. Um, <laughs> this is the amount. And he's like, okay, I'll drop a check in the mail today. And it was... Man, praise God, it was those situations again and again that God was proving himself faithful. As I was, as he was saying, hey, let me help you in this area, and whereas before I'd said, no, it's okay, God, I can, I can manage it. I was now saying, God, I'll let you. Here, I will trust you, and here's my representation of my faith. Money is just one of the ways that we represent how we trust God, but, but it is one of the ways. And so I was saying, God, here's one of the ways that I'm gonna trust you, and I'll trust that you'll take care of it. And praise God, he was so faithful. So that December was a standout month. Um, January and February and March, we continued, but all through this time, it was, it was difficult. And so the Lord kept bringing me back to 2 Corinthians. In chapter 9 of, of 2 Corinthians, there's these verses where Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, and he's encouraging them. 
In verse 7, he begins, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That is a powerful promise. I was clinging to that every morning. When my bills were coming due, I was like, okay, God, you promised I'd have more than enough. It continues in verse 9. It says, as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Verse 11, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. And so I was clinging to this. Okay, God, you promised that I'll have more than enough. Like, I'm going to give this first and foremost. I'm going to make it a priority because if it's not a priority, it just wasn't happening. Time and time again, we had kind of like, oh, well, if there's leftover, and that, it didn't work. So we were making it a priority saying, God, we will prioritize this kingdom value of living generously. And as we do so, we are trusting that you will provide the more than enough. And so January, February, March, we continued this pattern. We prioritized our giving and God showed up faithfully. We prioritized our giving, we gave it a first, even when our budget didn't make sense, even when the numbers didn't add up, and God brought money from other places and from other people, and we were able to, to pay all of our bills, and it was so miraculous. And during this time, the, one of the really cool things about it was Luna was so supportive. Luna was so on board. These were my mornings with God, and this is what God was speaking to me, but it hugely affected our family. Uh, it wasn't even though it was partly my decision, uh, Luna was so supportive to come alongside and say, yeah, I'll go on this, this giving journey with you. And, and the Lord really honored her support in that because not only did like all our bills get paid, but she was receiving extra gifts above and beyond what like the family was receiving. Like there were things that were specifically for her that people would give her that showed up. And I was and I'm looking and I'm like, okay, God, we need this bill to get paid and we need this bill to get paid. And then she'd receive a gift and it was like clothes or she'd receive a gift and like brand new like expensive headphones and it, she'd receive a gift of like cash. And I was like, God, we still have these bills. Like, I love that you're giving her things, but can you give all of us things in the family? But the Lord was taking care of her as this was my faith journey and she was supporting me in it. And even in the days when I felt like I didn't have faith, like, Luna, I don't know if we can really do this. She was saying, did God say it? And I'd say, yes. And she said, okay, then do it. And her faith encouraged me and her support encouraged me. And the Lord didn't neglect that, which was one of the really beautiful things that it wasn't like she had to suffer because God was doing something in Andrew. Like there was this beautiful unity of we both came together and we said, let's do what the Lord calls us to do. And as she supported that, the Lord took care of her specially. And that was really, really sweet. During this season, January through March, um, I was finding other passages in, in, in Romans and in Corinthians where Paul wrote about a ministry of giving and a gift of giving. And what I was understanding was, um, like, all of us worship on Sunday morning. We all just sang together. We all worshiped. But the people on this team, the people standing up here, they have a, a ministry of worship. And, and all of us share what God has done in our lives. All of us evangelize in that way. But some people have an evangelism ministry. And in the same way, some people have teenagers and some people have a ministry to teenagers. Uh, other people know, like, oh, please, on Wednesday nights, take my, take my student. We've got a, an incredible opportunity. This week is youth summer camp. Uh, they're doing a fundraiser breakfast out in the, in the lobby this morning. Um, raising money so that students can afford to go to summer camp this week. And they're doing so because there's this incredible ministry to youth that's happening here. And so if you want to uh, be a part of that or give into that or send your young person to get them out of your house because you're thinking, I have young people, but I don't have the ministry to young people, man, send them our way. We would love to take them this weekend. But as the Lord was showing me this, he was saying, Andrew, you've got a ministry of giving. Like all of us are called to be generous, but you have a, a ministry of giving and a gift of giving. And I thought, Oh, like, I thought I was a youth pastor. Like, here I have a whole other ministry that I didn't even know about, a ministry of, of giving, because what happens in the walls of the church is only a small part of what we do. As the body of Christ, like, we are called to do ministry outside of that. So when I'm inside the, the walls of the church, I'm, yeah, I'm ministry to youth. That's what I do. I love young people. But when I'm outside, when I'm in my home and I'm in my neighborhood, I have a ministry of giving. Along with a ministry to my family and to my children, I have a ministry of giving. And that was so encouraging. That really helped to give me a context 
for what God was calling me to. So January, February, March, those, those finished. And now I'm preparing myself because the Lord has spoken Philippians 1.6 to me. It says, and I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. It didn't say, and I, and I pray that you will put into the action the generosity that comes from working out your budget and, uh, and coordinating everything in the natural. It said, I pray that you would put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience the good things we have in Christ. Well, the last several months, I had been understanding and experiencing that God is my provider. That it's not just me. Like, if, if, I'm, if I am my provider, my income is, is relegated and reduced to just the first and the 15th and whatever my employer gives me. But when God is my provider, man, any day is payday. Every day. When Jesus teaches us to pray for that, like, give us our daily bread every day, Man, when God is your provider, every day is payday. And so I was, I was beginning to reframe my understanding of how finances worked. And in the kingdom of God, it's always backwards. It's always upside down and it's different. And so I was starting to live by a different set of values. And so I was saying, okay, God, if your word is true, which I believe it is, and if you haven't changed, which I know you haven't, then let's up the ante. We've been doing 20% and you've been faithful. Let's shoot for 40% and let's see what happens. Guys, that doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? That's stupid. <laughs> so I did it. April and May, we prioritized giving 40% of our income. Every time a paycheck came in, we, we, we siphoned off 40% of it, and we gave it away. We gave to churches. We gave to missionaries. We gave to indiv individuals. We gave to uh, a teacher who, who needed a car. We gave to friends. We gave to... Um, missionaries and, and everyone and everyone and wherever the Lord put on our heart, hey, give here. We give to churches that we don't even attend, but like we heard of what God was doing there and we said we want to be a part of that too. And so we invested in them. And there was this beautiful thing that was happening with a joy of giving. And it was, it was so fantastic to see God's faithfulness and his provision. It's, it doesn't make sense to give away that much money when you only make so little. Like ministry income is, is not a lot. It, 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 it's just any way you cut it. Like the church takes care of us, but it's not a lot of money. And, and to give away 40% of that for those two months was, was miraculous. But it wasn't easy. There was one week particular, um, both cars were, were on empty. Um, Luna's car has a digital fuel readout where it's got like the bars. All the bars had, had disappeared. So she clicked over to like the miles to empty where it tells you like how much you really have. And it had stopped counting. Like it, instead of... It was in the single digits. It was like, you've got five miles, you've got four miles, and then it just went dashes. And so we were on empty, and we didn't have any money left because we had already given it all away. And we were like, that's all right. Lord, you, are, you have to provide now. Like, you've made promises, and your promises are backed by the honor of your word, and so you, you've got to come through. And so that morning, it was a Sunday, Luna was praying. She drove into the church, pretty much coasting on fumes, and she's praying fervently because we need it. And she was saying, God, I just need 20 bucks, put a little bit of gas in the cars, we'll make it to the next, to the next. You know, that'll be our daily bread for a day, we'll make it today, and tomorrow we'll worry about itself. So she's praying for 20 bucks, praying for 20 bucks. First service goes by, and praying for 20 bucks, praying for 20 bucks. At the end of the second service, someone handed her an envelope, and she said, thank you, but we're trying to get kids, and trying to get out of here, and we're hungry, and I don't know if service went over, I'm not going to say that would, that doesn't sound like us. Um, but we were, we were hungry, and we wanted to get home. And, uh, and we get there, and, and she opens up the envelope, and it's $200 in cash. She had, she had prayed for 20, and the Lord gave 200. Yeah, praise God. We went to King Supers. We filled up both cars with gas. We got some eggs and milk, and the Lord took care of us. We were able to do, like, everything else we needed to until, like, the next, next pay period. And it was beautiful to see how God responded. But, but there were those moments where it was really trying, where it was like, Oh, God, did we make a mistake? And whereas I thought it took faith to write the checks, I quickly learned it took faith after the checks had, had been cashed and, and now, like, you were waiting for the next pay period. Like, that was when the faith really kicked in of, like, oh, God, did I make a mistake? Like, was this, did I miss you? What is happening? Like, why does it feel like I don't have anything? But every morning, going down in the basement and 
and spending time with God and standing on the word, praying the scriptures over our family and declaring his promises over our family. No, you promised I would have more than enough. You promised that, that you will always provide, that I could always live generously, that you'd produce a harvest of generosity in me. And so standing on those promises, it wasn't always easy. The Lord showed me this beautiful story in, in Mark chapter 8. To give you some context, uh, Jesus had fed the 5,000, and then a few chapters later, we see he feeds the 4,000, which are two different stories, both miraculous provisions. And then he finishes up with the 4,000, and he goes across the lake, and he arrives there, and there's some Pharisees, some real religious people. And they, they approach Jesus not from this heart of, oh, Jesus, like we've heard you're doing great things, but really critical, really nasty, really religious. I hope that you have it, but maybe you've been in a situation where you've experienced that real religious spirit. And so Jesus interacts with them for just a short while, and he says, no, no, no. Disciples, guys, let's get back in the boat. We're leaving this. I'm, I don't want to spend any time with him. And as they're rowing back to the other side of the lake, it's only been like a day since he fed the 4,000. He talks to them, and using an analogy, using a metaphor, he says, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. He's, he's warning them, beware of this spiritual and political mindset. Be aware, be on guard of this spiritual and religious spirit that would try and come against what, what, the, what God is doing in his kingdom. And disciples hear yeast, and they think bread. And then they're like, oh no, we didn't bring any bread. And, and this, is what it, this is what it says. Um, as they were crossing the lake, verse 15, Mark 8, Jesus warned them, watch out, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And at this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, why are you arguing about bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterwards? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet? And the Lord loving, uh, lovingly was speaking this to my heart of, hey, what did I do in, in May? How did I take care of you? And it's like, oh, yeah, you, in June, you know, you gave me the money for the car that I drive. Yeah, and how did I take care of you in December? Oh, you had that one guy that hadn't paid me in a year, and all of a sudden out of the blue called me. And they said, yeah, and how did I take care of you in January and February and March? And here I was, like, April and May and June, and I was thinking, God, God, I don't know if you can do this. Like, I have no bread. And he's saying, don't you remember? Don't you understand? Like, haven't you seen it? There are times in our life where God will meet a financial need that we have, and we say, wow, praise God, that was the Lord he provided. And then a month, two months, maybe a year later, we come into another financial need, and we're just as stressed about it as we were the first time. We've seen him provide for the 5,000. We've seen him provide for the 4,000. And now all of a sudden we're stressed out because we're in a boat and we're thinking, we don't have any bread. And there's no stores in this lake. And, it, and we let it get us so worked up when the, Jesus is right there with us. Emmanuel, we were just singing it. God with us. He's right there with us in that boat saying, don't you remember? Like, didn't I just do this? Like, don't you see what I'm doing? There are spiritual things that he was trying to teach me, but in the natural, I was just worried about the bread. He was trying to teach the disciples a larger spiritual understanding of, hey, beware of this religious and this political spirit. And they could only see their lack in the natural, that they couldn't understand the spiritual truths. And I think the same was true in my heart, that there was spiritual understanding that the Lord was trying to teach me about how the kingdom of God works backwards and upside down in the most beautiful of ways, and all I could see was my physical lack. And he was saying, let's, let's get past this so I can teach you even greater things. Let's get past just natural wealth so I can teach you kingdom wealth. Let's get past just natural provision so I can teach you supernatural provision. And I was like, oh God, like there is so much more that I still have yet to grow in and to, under, and to understand. My, my testimony ends that, that over this last year, we've been on an incredible journey of giving. And not only, this is the, the biggest part, and this is not that you would say, wow, Andrew really did this. This is all the glory to God. Not only were we able to pay all of our bills, but we had had some debt. We had a, an auto loan and we had um, some credit card debt from a home remodel project that didn't go as planned. And if any of you have ever seen a single home remodel show, you know they never go as planned. So I should have built in a larger buffer. I, buffer. I didn't. 
Anyways, we had a, a little bit of auto loan and a little bit of credit card debt. Despite living as generously as we have, um, our auto loan is, is paid off way ahead of schedule. Supernaturally, the Lord had um, forgiven $4,300 worth of debt uh, just in a moment. I had a phone call, and they are like, hey, Mr. Nemeth, like, you don't have to pay this back anymore. And I was like, that's not how loans work. <laughs> that's, but praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And so not only like, did we pay our bills through this time, not only did he meet all of our needs, but we were actually ahead of, of schedule where we thought we would be in paying off the, the loans and the debt that we had. And so praise God, praise God, praise God. As Pastor Mike comes up, I just want to encourage you guys with this testimony to say that there is a, there is a supernatural way that God wants to partner with you in your finances if you will trust him. Um, and, and your finances aren't the only way of, of showing that you have faith or that you believe in God. All of us are on a journey, and so maybe your step is somewhere different, but, but it is one of the ways that the Lord is speaking to my heart about all of us are called to live generously. I have a ministry of giving, but, but this is one of the ways that I, I show God, hey, God, I'm ready to trust you in this area of my life. So as we were preparing, we just felt like as we close this, what we want to do is, first of all, we want to be a church that is generous, that is, has a ministry of generosity, has a ministry of giving. So we're going to take an offering. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this, is, is, goes, this is so much bigger than just a church. This is a lifestyle of giving. And I hope that you guys get this. This isn't about, hey, we want more money in the church. We want to be givers. We want a lifestyle of giving. And what, what you're experiencing here and what you saw with this testimony is what we want for every person here, that we would be those that trust the Lord in every area of our life. And this is one of the hardest ones. It's one of the hardest ones to really let go of. We let go of other things, but this is the one that we have to say, God, we give you this area as well. And there's those of you that are actually called to be ministers of generosity. That is a ministry that you have. And I can tell you that if you're struggling financially, it's more than likely an area that you're supposed to be a minister of. It's, it's the thing that the enemy will try to attack and shut you down. And, and in your mind, you go, it's, there's no, that's, that's not for me. There's no way I can do that. So this is what we're going to do. Um, can we just all stand up? We're going to commission all of you. I was going to raise hands, but I'm like, you know what? You're all getting it. <laughs> and Andrew's going to pray as we close this, this service. And, uh, and I just want you to put your hands out. We did a commissioning last week after you heard Ray's testimony, and it was about being freedom fighters. This week, there's another commissioning here that we're going to be a church that is generous. And when we leave this place, that our hearts would actually begin to shift, that as we have compassion for people, as we see people in need, as the Lord puts it on our heart, that we begin to just live out of generosity. And we have a Father that will bless us back. When He sees, it's like when your children come to you and they're like, they've given things away. They've given their stuff to their friends. And they're like, Dad, can I have more? Like, of course you can. Because you're just going to give it away. You're going to love people. You're going to bless people. This is what the Father is looking for. So I'm going to let Andrew pray as we close this message. Father God, we ask that you would use our weakness to be made strong. Lord, that you would be shown perfect through our imperfections. And Lord, where there are areas in our lives where we haven't fully surrendered to you or trusted you to be good and to be faithful, Father, I pray that you would astound us with your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you that your faithful love endures forever. And so, Lord, we stand on your promises. Lord, I pray that you would break off a, a lack mentality or a spirit of poverty that would say that we don't have enough, that we can't afford to live generously. Lord, I pray that we would begin to believe what your word says, that we would believe that your promises are true, 
And Lord, that we would understand the inheritance that we have and the access that we have to live supernatural lives, that we would be generous people. Lord, that we would live generously, making your goals, making your ministries, Father, the priorities of our life. Father, I pray that you would resource us so that we could bless your kingdom, that we would be blessed to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are now commissioned as ministers of generosity. Uh, if I get the, or the ministry team to come up, if you want prayer for anything, uh, if you would like to receive even prayer over just your finances, situations there, please come up. Otherwise, have a blessed week with him. Love you guys. We'll see you next week.